Well, good morning, everyone. It's a, it's a privilege and an honor to, to be with you today. And, uh, you know, in, in reflecting on my ministry in the last 30 years as a priest, there are many aspects that, that I experience weekly and very joyful celebrations as well as uh, very sad ones. And funerals are a regular part of my ministry. And often because I have two busy parishes, I celebrate multiple funerals in one week. And you kind of get used to that, especially when people die in the normal course of things. And it seems like it's just unfolding in the natural order of life. My own father died two and a half years ago at the age of 86. And it was a very beautiful experience uh, in the days leading up to my father's death when my three siblings and I and my mother cared for him along with the, the wonderful hospice staff. We were able to celebrate mass around his bed. And because he was no longer able to, to take anything uh, in, in food, I was able to administer the Eucharist to him by dipping my finger in the precious blood and placing it on his lips. We were praying for the hours before he died around his bed and prayed him into heaven. And although it was certainly sad and continues to be a great loss, it just seemed natural in the course of God's plan that we're all going to die someday. But it's an entirely different experience when we experience the death of a child. That's something that I as a priest never get used to. The child may be an adult, the child may be very young, but what these deaths have in common is that a parent buried the child. And a child, no matter what age, always remains your child as a parent. From the sound of the mother's voice to an infant, to a mother suffering for her adult child. That bond between mother and child, between father and child is an unbreakable, unique bond. And that is why the death of a child just seems so wrong. Something about it is that we experience is just wrong and that it shouldn't be. And we do not believe that, that these untimely deaths are God's will. But somehow it's connected to the mystery of evil in the world and the mystery of innocent human suffering, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But first I just want to reflect a little bit on my ministry to, to grieving parents. I remember each of these deaths vividly. And I remember frankly how afraid I was to reach out to the grieving parents. What would I say? What could I say? Early in my priesthood, I had only been ordained a couple of years. I remember getting a call that a young man, 17 years old, who had been part of our youth group uh, had died by suicide. I was grief stricken myself because I knew the young man well. But I remember thinking, how am I going to go and talk to his parents? I was terrified. And I remember forcing myself to get into the car. And Matt's mother greeted me at the door. And we embraced and honestly, I, it, feel, it felt like she was consoling me more than I, her. There absolutely were no words whatsoever. And yet I have to say that God was very powerfully present in that moment. It 
in speaking to you today, I, I do so with a great sense of uh, humility in realizing that only you parents who have experienced the loss of a child can truly understand what another parent is going through. And those of us who seek to bring some comfort and consolation can only do so in not pretending that we understand your experience, but only wanting to be with you in your pain and somehow allowing God to be present in that interaction. The other experiences that I had were quite similar. Tom was a 28 year old man who died of AIDS. His father was particularly gripped by the stigma that was still attached to that death at that time. But I remember arriving at the house and again, I just embraced his mother and we both cried. What could I say? What could be said? Recently, just a couple of years ago in my own parish, a young 16 year old girl died in her sleep. It may, it may have been a, pre, a congenital heart condition that nobody knew about, but, but her parents were just left completely stricken. And I remember sitting in their living room along with their loved ones who were there, their closest friends and their family, arms around each other and just sitting together in silence. Just a couple of years ago also, I got a call from my mother that my cousin's son, age 17, had died by suicide. I remember been traveling to another state to see my cousin. Hundreds and hundreds of people around them at the church and just holding each other and weeping with no words to say. When I was in the seminary, I took a course that was called God and the Mystery of Human Suffering. And this, this course uh, traced uh, the theological thinking about this mystery of innocent human suffering throughout the history of, of, of Christianity from its biblical roots uh, through modern theological thought. The, the, biblical, uh, the biblical story of, of suffering is somewhat of a mixed bag. On the one hand, Jesus reached out and healed so many people. And yet he himself in embracing the cross didn't stop that suffering from happening. The medieval mystics sometimes overly glorified suffering and thought that that was their way of drawing close to Christ, that the more suffering, the better. But then as we go into modern uh, times and particularly post-Holocaust reflection on suffering, we basically raise our hands and realize that, that it's a mystery. We don't understand why bad things happen to good people, why unthinkable things happen. But what we can do as Christians is look at the cross. When we ask ourselves where God is in the midst of innocent human suffering, realize that God is not far from us, is not aloof or far away, but rather has come very close to us in the suffering of Jesus. I just wanna reflect for a moment on the way that God embraced humanity. God didn't become human in some triumphal way of using almighty power to, uh, to wield influence on the earth. Think about the Annunciation. With the angel appearing to Mary and telling her that she would conceive and bear a son by the power of the Holy Spirit. Imagine how terrified she was, a young girl 
who was being told that that she was going to, to conceive and bear a son. And, and she said, well, how can that be? Because I have no relations with a man. I'm betrothed to Joseph, but we haven't been together. And he said, but the, the angel said, well, by the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll conceive. And you think that Mary said at that point, oh, okay, now I get it. I mean, how terrified she must have been. And as far as we know, that was the only angelic vision that Mary ever had in her human life. And for the rest of her life, like you and me, she had to live by faith. I wonder what must have gone through her mind when she and Joseph were forced you know, to, to have their child in a barn, in a stable, with no place to lay her newborn infant's head. She must have thought, if he's supposed to be the son of God, is this the way that it's supposed to come about? And not long after that, they were forced into exile in Egypt to flee from Herod's wrath so that her child wouldn't be killed. At the presentation of Jesus in the temple, Mary was told that by the prophet Simeon, that a sword would pierce her heart so that the, the thoughts of many may be laid bare. At that moment, Mary did not know your suffering as a parent who has lost a child, but she would in fact know that suffering. She would in fact see her son tortured and murdered. And yet somehow she still could see through that to trust God at that moment. His death did not have the final word for Jesus and death is not the final word for your child. I believe with all my heart that you will see your child again. If only we could see what your precious child now sees. What must it be like to behold the face of God when all of life's suffering and darkness and turmoil and ambiguity is taken up in a moment in God's perfect eternal presence? Paul says in his letter to Corinthians that we now see indistinctly as in a mirror, but then we shall see God as God is face to face. And you can commune with your child even now. In the communion of saints, we are not separated from those who have gone before us. As we say in, the, in this funeral ritual, Lord, for those who believe in your love, life is changed, not ended. And, 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 and just imagine yourself embracing your child once again and your child looking down on you with words of consolation that they are at peace and they are filled with joy and they are embraced by the God who knows them and loves them completely. If Christ is not risen from the dead, as scripture says, then we are the most pitiable of creatures. That is our hope. And that is the hope that I hold out to you. But I do so with great humility. No one who has him or herself not lost a child can truly understand your experience. But God does. And Mary does. And no one can tell you what to feel. If you're finding comfort in God and in your faith, what a blessing that is. If you are angry with God, then let your feelings flow. God's love for us is impossible to comprehend fully. In human terms, there is no image more powerful than a mother's love for her child. As we hear so powerfully in the words of Isaiah, can a mother forget the baby at her breast, and have no compassion for the child she bore. 
though she may forget, I will not forget you. Thank you.